How is everybody doing? Massacred 
African Americans in 1876 during the Hamburg Massacre, as well as in 1893 as governor, he, was, he sent an African American in Denmark, South Carolina by the name of John Peterson to a lynch mob. So then the story gets closer to home. There was a white man in Greenwood named Thomas Tolbert who was allowing African Americans to vote at a, at a nearby store. Well, needless to say, some of the followers of Benjamin Tillman were none too happy with this. So they went into the store and they caused a ruckus and gunshots were fired. And this is what led to the Greenwood Massacre of 1898. This was where African American, a number of African Americans were lynched, chained to logs, beaten and so forth. And it was a grand catastrophe. The battle it was so vicious that even Benjamin Tillman got up and said this. He said, he said, if you want to kill those Tolberts, go to it, but leave those poor Negroes alone. This is how terrible things were in 1898. So Benjamin E. Mays and his father were somewhere near the house when a mob who had been doing the lynching and killing happened to come by and they saw uh, Benjamin Mays and Hezekiah walking down the road. And in front of Benjamin, they pat him at gunpoint, bow down and take off his hat and put the hat in the middle of the road to this mob. And Benjamin would say many years later in his autobiography, Born to Rebel, that was my earliest memory. And as time went on, he said that that made him determined to be a catalyst into ending these kinds of conditions. So as time continued, he turned out to be far brighter than most of the young boys of his community. So much so that a local minister detected his intelligence and arranged in 1911 for him to attend the newly formed South Carolina State University. And it was at South Carolina State where he saw intelligent, literate black men and women who were making real strides and real changes in people's lives. And this alerted him to the possibilities that could be. <coughs> And this forever dispelled the notion to him that was trying to be forced upon the African Americans. The idea that they were good at all things involving the body, but nothing involving the mind. That was unfortunately passed through many, through the generations. But, he took, but in order for him to stay at South Carolina State, now remember, his parents were poor. So in order to stay at South Carolina State, he had to clean the outhouses as work study to get them to South Carolina State. But you know, sometimes they say you have to stoop to conquer. And that's what he did. Because he did so well at that, that he obtained a scholarship to Bates College in Maine. And it was at Bates College that he learned something. That contrary to everything he had been taught, he was intellectually able to compete with people who were of a different hue than him. And that even further, further opened him up to the possibilities that could be. So much so that he, so much so that around the time he was at Bates College, excuse me, Bates College, he was asked to speak at Benedict College in 1926. And the speech that he gave was called the Goal. And here is a portion of that message. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, with one stroke of his pen, how appropriate since it's Lincoln's birthday as we speak broke the chains of physical slavery. But there is another chain that Lincoln could not break. That chain is not physical, it is mental. The Negro, though freed by Lincoln, emerged from slavery with a slave psychology, an inferiority complex. In the main, he thought like a slave. He acted like a slave. He crouched, cringed, and coat collared like a slave. To him, the white man was God. And 63 years is a comparatively short time in which to breed out this inferiority complex. Too often, the Negro child has been led to believe that he cannot do the things that the white child can do. He clips his ambition, crushes his genius, and often a great mind goes undeveloped. But he encouraged the students to take the knowledge that they gained at places like Benedict College and to go out from the communities in which they came to show young people the opportunities of what could be. 
and make themselves basically a living witness to the lie of that inferiority complex. And interestingly enough, while Benjamin Mays made that speech, a man was heard at the door of where Mays was speaking saying that, that Mays was, that this young man is quite radical. He has a lot to learn. <laughs> so he went on to get his doctorate from the University of Chicago. And then from there, he became the president of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. But perhaps to him, his greatest honor was that right outside of Spartanburg, a place called Packard, South Carolina, Spartanburg County, was Benjamin E. Mays High School, where every year he would come back and give a speech to the students. And he impressed all who heard him. I have a friend up in uh, Myrtle Beach, who just recently retired from Myrtle Beach High School, named Patricia Millett. And she told me these words when she heard Dr. Mays speak at Morris Brown College in 1972. She said, I knew he was a native of South Carolina, and I heard much about him. And to actually hear the man who inspired so many people was unforgettable. He was so eloquent that I could see how he was able to bring out the best in young people. Now, however, there were those who uh, didn't always listen. In 1969, at the height of student rebellions, there were some radical students at Morehouse College who actually held Dr. Mays hostage, along with uh, another one of the college's trustees, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. Father of. And they made these demands, and of course the police were called and they were arrested and kicked out of school. But you might have heard about the ringleader of uh, this group. After the ringleader was kicked out, he went on to the West and studied acting. You might have heard of him. His name was Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> yes, that one. But one of the most, one of the greatest acts of virtuosity in history, I think, is what Dr. Mays did in 1935. In 1935, Dr. Mays joined a group of scholars that went over to India because they heard these stories about how this little brown man in India was using nonviolence to free the people of India from the British yoke. So they sat down with Mohandas K. Gandhi. And they said, Gandhi, please come to America and help your black brothers in our struggle for liberation. And Gandhi, in his wisdom, sat back and said, well, I wish I could, but there's one problem, gentlemen. Uh, what's that? Well, I got to finish making this thing work here before I can do it anywhere else. And so they were, so Dr. Mays and Dr. Mordecai Johnson and uh, Howard Thurman and a few others, they were, I said, Oh, well, we're sorry, we didn't mean to bother. He said, no, 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 gentlemen. He said, it may be that through the Negroes of America that the world will get a greater understanding of what I am trying to do. And they're like, huh? And he's like, trust me, gentlemen. Okay, so fast forward to 1948. Dr. Mays and Dr. Mordecai Johnson of Howard University were telling a group of students about this experience in one of their lectures. And there was this young man who was about 18 years, 19 years old at the time. And he was wondering what could be done about this almost impregnable situation of segregation, discrimination, low self-esteem, and all these other issues. But then he heard about how these men met with Gandhi, and about Gandhi's struggle to free the people of India through the use of nonviolence and the wisdom of his message, and what he said regarding black people in America. And the young boy, th the young boy thought long and hard of this, and became Dr. May one of Dr. Mays' greatest known mentees. You might have heard of him, Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs> Let that sink in for a moment. So Dr. Mays went on to become the head of the Atlanta School Board. Before he died in 1984, there are stories of him going out into the streets of Atlanta, seeing young kids <coughs> on the street corner, smoking weed, playing hooky, drinking and things like that, and him going up to them and said, young man, why are you not spending your time constructively in the schoolhouse? And so forth. 
embarrassing them, giving them the grandfatherly image that they may not have ever had at home before, and encouraging them to do well. All of this was before he died at the ripe old, uh, died in about the ripe old age of 90 in 1984. And he lived to see the people of South Carolina give him great honor and in Greenwood County. He once said that he was full of hate for South Carolina at one time, but now he said, I love my fellow South Carolinians. Now, before, now there are a couple of things that I want to leave you with in regard to Dr. Mays. <clears throat> Number one, you see, you never know what impact you have on a young person. As an, as an instructor for the last 20 years, I've had many young people come up to me and remind me of things that I said to them when they were students that helped them to go ahead. And I go, I don't remember that. But you never know the seeds you plant and where those seeds are going to grow. So Smokey Robinson, the singer, once said in a song, be kind to the growing mind. So you never know. They're listening as all this is happening. So another part of this is something else to consider. There is, a, there is an, old, an old saying from the Middle Ages that goes like this. It is always darkest before the dawn. And think about this. Dr. Mays saw the horror of the Phoenix Massacre, where they made his father, this clan type mob made his father bow down to him. And he was determined to do something to stop it. A lot of times nowadays, come, people come to the least bit of adversity, and they think that the world is so miserable and it's all over. No, 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 no. From the low misery of the Phoenix Massacre, not only did he go on to inspire generations of young people, he mentored the young man who played an extremely large part in reducing many of the conditions that Dr. Mays saw in his own youth. And so I say all that to tell you folks that we honor Dr. Benjamin Mays because unlike so many people today who deal with the misery of the world and the negativity thereof, he showed us the possibility of what could be if we tried. Thank you. Quite all right. 